Hello and welcome to another video for One Love Sprocket. And today we have this vintage sport rock by Specialized. Uh, I think it's a hybrid, I'm not quite sure because I don't have any wheels on it just yet. So I'm going to find out with, the, uh, with some uh, review. Uh, I've seen some better days, obviously, because that's typically what happens with older, older bikes. Uh, chromoly frame or possibly steel, but probably chromoly based on the era, so that's probably, that's probably what's the best one. It doesn't necessarily say, it just says specialized frame system, whatever that means. So, uh, but it's, it has center full brakes on it, um, or sorry, cantilever brakes, so sorry about that. Cantilever brakes, and uh, has some older Shimano on here, uh, Asaki uh, frame, but uh, pretty beat up of the, the cable housing is completely shot so bad that the, the plastic has completely disintegrated. I left their cable sitting there for the, the, the derailleur uh, cable housings. So a lot of stuff there. I believe this thing's frozen in here because I assumed that this is probably what was sold. Uh, crank is uh, stiff. That effect it doesn't move at all. So that's going to be interesting. This is an extra large frame as well, and you can see with a very high gooseneck stem here, this is pretty high for, for a larger guy, much taller than me, 6'2", maybe, something like that, because that's what it looks like, this can be probably like a 20, 22, 20, at least a 22, maybe a 23 inch frame. I haven't measured it out yet, but I'm sure it comes around there. Very high rise, a handlebar again, so you can get up a little higher, so otherwise you're, not, otherwise you're leaning way over and you can get back to the problems. Anyway, so um, not too bad. Uh, headset doesn't seem that bad. It, it seems to move pretty good. Uh, somebody did take out the um, the counter brakes on the front and put in some D brakes, which I might want to do on both the front and the back. Although I do see that the cable actually looks really clean, so it looks like that was something they've done recently to at least say, hey, this works, so I'm just going to let it sit. Uh, obviously, the front one is kind of maybe so so. Anyway, so that's what I'm looking at here. So I'm looking to uh, just, you know, like I say, first blush, just looking at this. Obviously, the, uh, the this is really bad. Uh, it's it's pulled back over here. There's no there's no tension at all on the on the pullback on the pulley the the, the ribs are rather pulleys. So I don't know if it's been it's been you know flipped around. That's that happens at times. Um, the chain obviously is rusted as always, you know, but that typically is what happened, happens. And, uh, but I don't see, I mean, it's a little scratched up, but no major dance, uh, not something that I could look at and just say, oh, no, that's, that's not good. I mean, there's, there's, there's some flash rusting here that probably came out from maybe inside the frame itself, because obviously it does have some weak holes and things like that to kind of get some, so if it does get some water in there, it has like, some place to escape, either through the bottom bracket, through the maybe the, the two bands inside the the, the, the uh, natural stem or the uh, the head tube or things like that. So anyway, um, not looking too bad, but again, definitely has uh, some some work to do. So I'll break it down, do a better assessment of what I think I need to do. I think it just maybe maybe just need the frame will just need basically a, a cleanup and maybe just apply a clear coat to it. Again, that's typically what I try to do because I I don't necessarily try to repaint it, reattach it, decals, and stuff like that. That's too much work. <laughs> I, I mean, I would do it if I, if I felt it was it was required, but for the most part, these bikes, I mean, as long as it has paint on it, it's, it'll protect it from the, the, the elements and things like that. And that's really what it's about. And I'm not saying, again, it's not, it's all scratched up, no, it's all not that bad. So that will be okay. So, all right, sounds good. Let's uh, dive into this thing and have some fun. So the first thing I did was to take off the seat post, or at least try to, and had I not been able to take out the seat post, I would have been leaving it, no doubt, for uh, as an abandoned project because that would have been almost impossible. Sometimes they, they, I've had troubles with those in the past. But again, luckily, using my vice grips, I was able to get it out without too much trouble, and it was... Uh, yeah, a little, a little bit of work, obviously, wiggling it around, but it finally did come out without without too much damage or, or any problems there. And as you can see, there was definitely some, some rust down in there. Um, needed to work on that later. 
from there I started looking at the the chain to start to disassemble the, the rear, rear derailleur. Now if you notice the, the rear derailleur is actually pulled through and that is a as usually caused by it having having it wrap around the the rear sprocket and that could have happened many many years ago so I have no idea all I just know is that it was part of the problem so I used my chain breaker went ahead and uh, you know broke the chain and went ahead and, and worked slowly it was the chain was so rusted I was expecting not to use that chain again uh, I have restored that kind of a chain before if you look at my video on the Trek 360 restoration, I actually did fix that chain. I actually did restore that piece. So if you want to see how it's done, uh, it was just a lot of work and, and effort and I really didn't see this one. This was really stiff and I was not worth the effort uh, in my view. So I went ahead and removed this chain with a lot of uh, twisting and, and pulling and wiggling on it to be able to get it through the the, uh, the idler, idler pulleys on the rear derailleur but once I did get it out of course then I it was just it just went straight to the trash I just I'm not gonna worry too much about that for the, for the amount of, of, of the cost of, of a new chain it's it's not worth the effort so as I started working on the rear derailleur I I started twisting it around and it it did take a little bit of brute force actually to get it. I was trying to be careful. I didn't want to break it because I do like using the original components for most of my builds. Obviously for restoration. And restoration is to restore, not to rebuild. So once I realized what I what had happened, I had to be careful not to break it. But that's because there's a catch on the back side that, that holds it in position. And it had been it had been twisted past that enough to, to cause it to not work correctly. So again, that, that was just something else for me to do. I did finally get it, but it took a little bit of work, that's all. As you can see now, it, it springs as, a cord, as it should because it, it, there has to be some tension on, this, on the chain as you go through your different gears, and now it's working as I would expect it to work. I then went ahead and took off the rear derailleur. Um, as you can see, the, the derailleur cable guide is completely destroyed I mean it's the the plastic is is gone uh, you can see that the bear there's there's the bare housing underneath the wires just complete not not even worth it it's just it's just a complete waste uh, I knew I was going to be replacing cable guides anyway so I was not too concerned about it but there you go from there I started working on the crank and removing the the, the crank getting off the the nuts that hold it on removing the using my crank remover tool I decided to check to see what wheel size this bike actually was because I, again I still wasn't sure if it was a a 700 C 27 inch 26 inch I didn't think it was anything smaller than that just because of the size of the frame but I went ahead and put on a 26 inch wheel to confirm that the if the brake pads were would connect to a 26 inch wheel and I knew that that was the size wheel that I had and I would be able to work with that from that point on from there I removed the rear brake now that I knew what size wheel it was I was happy to know that it was something easy for me to do so from there I took off the front derailleur and kind of gave a quick look at it didn't seem to be that bad just a little dirty and a little bit of rust here and there but again that's to be expected on this bike that's probably been sitting out in the rain for some time at that point I went ahead and worked on the bottom bracket I could tell by looking at it that there was definitely some some caking and some some corrosion and from the close-up you can see although somewhat blurry you can see that there is definitely caked in uh, junk and everything it was pretty bad there actually was a plastic insert inside that was the precursor to the sealed bearing or cartridge approach that was difficult for me to get out because it was so caked in there and I mean it was just the the rust was incredible for for this type of a bike even though it is steel 
typically you don't have there's there's usually enough grease in there to to more or less mitigate a lot of the of the corrosion and, and rust and things like that but it, it this was just absolutely over the top i've never seen that much caking of of junk inside as i have this, on this bike i removed all the excess screws for the bottle cages and um, any of the panniers that they were going to be using but from there I, re I moved on to removing the handlebars and the grips, the shifters, the brakes, and finally removing the, the handlebars themselves. From there I moved on to the gooseneck or quill stem and I unfortunately forgot that I shouldn't take the handlebars out so fast because it's a nice leverage to help me loosen up the the lock nut that's used on the inside of the stem to connect it to the fork so I had to go ahead and put it back in just to give me a little bit of something to hold on to a couple whacks with my mallet helps to loosen up that stem because obviously it does get pretty corroded inside um, I did have a little bit a little bit of trouble trying to get that thing out of there it was definitely stuck in there so again that's part of the, the fun of doing this kind of, kind of stuff. So a nice little bike hack as you can see I'm using my handlebars as one lever and my PVC pipe as a second lever just to kind of twist it, break it loose and once I was able to break it loose then it came out nice and easy. But definitely very corroded and nasty looking but that's again part of the problem. Gotta clean all that stuff up. And to continue with my bike hack, I use my PVC to hold the fork in place as I take off the lock nut on the headset. And once I break that free, it's usually pretty easy to take apart. That, that lock nut actually is it's not too difficult at times, even though it was somewhat corroded. The, the threads were clean and it didn't take much to take it off. The top race did give me a little bit of some issues, only because of the fact it was pretty well set. So I did have to use some channel locks to loosen up a little bit. I didn't want to grab it too much because I didn't want to score the, the knurled edge, but it, enough to, to break it loose. Again, it's just the, the threads were not a problem. It was just a matter of it. time is all the issue was here. Removing the bearing cups also is a fun job because that's where I can really bang this thing. These are they're pressed in to the, the head tube and for the most part it's just a matter of just banging them out with uh, with an interesting little uh, it used to be a breaker bar that that broke and so I now use it as a as a just use it for banging things and, and it works actually it works really good okay so <clears throat> I stripped this thing completely down to the frame and as expected um, it's um, not too bad it actually looks in, in pretty good condition it's sound as far as all the welds concerned um, obviously quite a bit dirty. Uh, the uh, bottom bracket was, as I discovered, it was <laughs> uh, caked with rust. Uh, no doubt there had been some water, had, had probably come down through the top top of the, uh, the seat tube or something like that and just accumulated down there because there was a significant amount of rust in the inside. As well as one of the bearing races, or sorry, one of the bearing cages had, um, had just <laughs> got chewed up pretty bad and uh, left the, the bearings just kind of rolling around in there with all the extra metal from the cage, uh, as I showed kind of over during the, during the video. And, uh, but uh, <clears throat> what, once I got that out of there, then it, again, it looks just look too bad. Again, I, I, I didn't check the races. I didn't check the cups really well. I just, I'm just, right now, just, I just took it all apart. So I was down to the bare, bare frame, and now I'll start to clean it and get prepped to, to see what the next steps are. Obviously, I, I typically like to, when I build a new bike, oh, uh, and also, I did check to see if this was a 26 inch wheel, and it is. Strangely enough, because the frame is so large, uh, it looks like it could possibly be a Scepter C, which is basically what I would be considered a, a, a hybrid bike. Uh, that is not the case, so it's, it's still considered a not bike because of the fact it has 26 inch wheels. Uh, I mean, it, I'll, I'll build it out that way because it, it has enough space 
to, to accommodate obviously the, the large tires, so I knew that that was probably the case, but I did check it just to make sure. Anyway, going back to what I was talking about here, so now I'm going to start to clean everything, prep it, prep the frame, get it to the point where I feel it's, I feel pretty comfortable about the way it looks, and then like I said, I probably just put a, a clear coat on there. Unfortunately, that looked bad at all. Uh, I didn't I, I didn't take out the, the brakes, the front brakes, I'll take those off in a little bit. But they didn't look bad at all. Uh, the frame, the fourth part, I can say, looks looks good. Uh, there's nothing really, you know, amazing about it that I said, oh, I just just awesome. just can't do this. Now, what I could possibly do, and this may be a little difficult, but I could potentially replace this fork with a suspension fork because, of course, kind of give it a little more of a thing. The problem here's my issue is that the distance for this. For the steer tube itself is so large for me to be able to find another fork like usually because a threadless fork is i got to convert this from a threaded fork into a threaded threadless fork for me to be able to find something that has this long of a steer tube is very difficult so uh, it, in the essence of what i typically do i mean this would be a nice that would be a nice little conversion project but uh under the under the guise that this is just not going to be a bike that will be used for for jumping off, uh, you know, ledges or going down some, some really broken trails, I will assume that that will be the case. Regardless, I think just for the restoration project that I'm doing, I restore the, the, the fork itself, put it back to the bike, and, and we're, we're, we're on our way. So, but that that is, again, this is now my, my assessment of what I have here. Again, have not looked at any of the components other than just saying, okay, cable can be replaced, you know, things I was mentioning at the beginning of the, of the, of the video. And uh, so, but uh, as far as I'm concerned, I'd say there's some very minor scratches, I'd say. It's, to me, it's just, it's just dirty. That's all it is. Really just, you got a little bit of rust. Uh, there's some, some spots where some exposed metal got, got rusted. The weep holes, as I mentioned, towards the bottom down here, definitely had some water leaking out of them because obviously water got into it somehow. Probably like say through here, just try to channel down through the weak holes in the and the, the chain stays and the, and the seat stays. So at least it, it got in there somehow. Uh, but I did. I did it very well. Maybe it was water was just. I mean, it, just it just sat outside. It either got in maybe through the um, the brazon, possibly too. Some water got into the into the bottom right. I don't know. All I can say is I see the results and I know I have to work on that. So looks pretty good. Uh, all right, so then I will go in and go ahead and attach this thing and see if I can get this thing now to start to look like a, a restored bike. So to begin the first step, I looked over the frame and basically cleaned it up first. I usually start with my trusty mineral spirits as it's a good cleaner to get off you know the dirt and stuff like that without really attacking the the clear coat but it does have some residue that's left over so usually what I will do then is go back over everything after I've kind of cleaned it up and taken off any rust to remove that, that, that residue with some either rubbing alcohol or isopropanol or possibly even acetone. Acetone I don't like using too much because it's a little bit more aggressive on the clear coat and I would prefer to use something that's a little more neutral like, like the, the alcohol. I also look for any places where there was some minor rusting or surface rust that I could take out with a little fine steel wool. I do use that at times for some of the things that I, I want to clean up because it doesn't, even though it may attack the, the clear coat a little bit underneath it, since I'm planning to recoat it anyway then it doesn't make it doesn't really make much difference. As a matter of fact, scoring the, the clear coat actually provides a better adhesion surface and allows the second clear coat, of the, the, the newer clear coat, to, atta to attach itself better. I also use the Dremel tool to, to remove the, the, the heavier rust and at least, at least clean up some of the stuff. I don't try to go too aggressive on that either because I don't want to leave bare metal. Um, only because of the fact that then I'd have to either A, repaint it or do something with it. But I do try to like take up as much as I can only so it's not quite as noticeable as, as rust. And, and it, this bike did have 
a couple of locations where there was more rust than I really liked, but again, that was not too bad. I also took advantage of the opportunity to kind of straighten out the rear derailleur hanger. That was just a slightly bent. I mean, it wasn't too bad, but since I had everything off, I was able to sight it rather good. I do not have a the, the proper tool for that. There is a, a rear derailleur hanger aligner, and I don't have one. I think I might have to get myself one because I do use it quite often. Because usually the rear derailleur does get banged up by different, you know, just by using it, um, you know, you drop your bike, it, it, it hits the rear derailleur, it causes it to, to bend. That's why they actually created one that is removable or can be replaced because of the fact that it was, this, this bike obviously was the precursor to that because it's all steel and if for anything it were to happen, it breaks it off, then pretty much you've toasted the, the frame and uh, the bike has to be, your, your frame has to be replaced. So that's kind of why there's there they have the newer ones that are usually either aluminum or something that is just bolted onto the frame itself and can be replaced if necessary. I noticed there was significant rust around the rear wheel uh, hangouts and uh, the dropouts because they were uh, they probably had been again collecting water and and generating the rust because of the the way that the wheel will actually score the, the the paint and then again that's just an avenue for for water to get in there and make contact with the bare metal hence you get your rust and of course rust is always the biggest one of the biggest issues that a bike will have is because of the especially if it's not well taken care of or not protected from the elements so I decided to move outside to give me a little bit more ambient light because I was now reaching the final stages of prepping the frame with my last piece using the acetone. I also scraped off the chain protector that's on one of the chain stays or this yeah the, the chain stays because that is um, I wanted to replace that with a new one so I went ahead and took that off. The acetone is a really good solvent to remove that, that gum and the adhesive that's used there. It was, it was so old as, anyway, so I had to take it off because I didn't want to leave it there for to try to paint over the top of that, put a clear coat on that. I then did my last inspection just using a flashlight to see if I could see anything that I might have missed during the frame prep and started to, in the waiting light, put the clear coat on and uh, using my flashlight to kind of help me out to know which uh, where I'd gotten where I missed because of the shininess obviously of what I was doing absolutely could could usually get a pretty good idea the nice thing about clear coat I'm not too concerned about runs or or things like that because for the most part it's not too difficult from there I moved on to cleaning the fork and prepping the fork itself and, and be able to get a lot of the, the junk off. There was actually somebody had uh, put a cycle computer on there and had put it on with some tape or something. And so I had to scrape it off with a razor blade. Just very, sh just shave it off with the, with the razor blade to get to, to not damage the, obviously don't want to get down past the clear coat. But again, since this bike is old anyway, it's not like a huge deal, but hey, you know what? I do what I can. From there I cleaned it with a little bit of acetone to kind of just kind of clean it up get the the junk off and and a little bit of the haze did the best i could to get the the rest of the stuff i missed off and use my dremel tool as well of course to kind of clean up some of the rust clean around the, the crown race get that cleaned up then with the pipe cleaner i went ahead and cleaned out some of the junk inside the the actual steer tube got that looking a little bit better too that was actually a Nice touch, not something I was going to initially plan to do, but again, because I did have it, I was smart enough to go ahead and use that as well. And then I masked off the, the post for the, the front brake, as well as the crown raise and, and things like that. So basically just leaving the exposed paint surfaces. Found a little spot that I missed as well, so I continued with my razor blade to just clean that up. And the final cleaning with the acetone, being careful not to leave too much in the way of, of lint and things like that. I know I should use cheesecloth or something like that, but you know what? Again, I'm, I'm not, I'm no professional. I just kind of do this thing to, 
to make it look the best I can, but I do I do try to get as much of the junk off as I can before I go and, and spray it. Just sprayed it, right, just held it in my hand, just went ahead and put it, put the clear coat on, did the best I could there, and hung it with the rest of the fork, or the rest of the bike, I should say. It was, uh, the frame was pretty much ready. I went back to the frame and found that I had, there was a couple places that were slightly opaque and I didn't like the way they looked, so I went ahead and hit them again with a second coat of clear coat. So when doing a reconstruction, the first thing I like to do is to put the headset on and attach the fork to the frame to kind of see the whole thing as it should look before I put any of the other components on. Since this is a threadless fork, it does have some older technology and for the most part with the hardened cups and cones, the races, uh, it does actually, it's pretty self, I mean, it's, it's rather bulletproof as far as putting it together. I mean, it, it takes a lot of abuse and doesn't really get uh, messed up as, as easily as maybe some, some of the other newer technology. Uh, seal bearings are really nice and all that stuff, but at the same time, it just means you don't have access to them and it, it makes it much harder to to service and, and that's why having these, it, they are somewhat open and, and of course you can get dirt and grime in there rather easily, rust, etc. But as long as you keep these serviced and, and are able to pull them apart, clean them up, put them back together, they actually do work quite well. There is a tendency at times to get dimpling, which is basically where you, or pinging as what they call it as well, where you can actually indent the ball bearings into the races or the cups and causes some chatter as, you, as it spins because it doesn't have a really smooth rotation. Uh, but for the most part, that is not too common and it really is for people that like doing jumps or really creating a lot of impact on those things to really cause that kind of dimpling. But for the, for the typical use, it's not that way. So again, this is where I'm, I'm going through and, and cleaning it up, uh, checking the, the races, making sure that they're all clean, checking that the bell bearings themselves, you know, making sure that the cages are clean. And once I do that, of course, with using my favorite my favorite solvent, uh, mineral spirits, then I go ahead and reassemble everything back on the bike with the cups and cones and the bearings with a liberal application of grease. I also installed the seat post because I wanted to hold it with the clamp instead of it on the freshly clear coated frame and junk that up so I thought it would be easier for me to grab it there. So I put the, the seat post retainer bolt on as well as the rather long, interestingly enough, seat post but I wanted to use that and be able to grab that. So it was at least something a little bit easier for me to, to manage from that perspective. Next is the quill stem, gooseneck, typically what is used as the handlebar holder to connect that to the fork, allowing the steering mechanism to work correctly. And this was quite rusted and had significant amount of age and wear on it so there was plenty of rust to remove. I also cleaned up the wedge-shaped expander plug that is used to affix the gooseneck or quill stem in the steerer tube of the fork. Once all the rust was off I went ahead and gave it a nice coating of new black paint to at least make it look newer although it necessarily won't be, ne be newer but at least it looks that way. Once the paint had dried, I then went ahead and reassembled the gooseneck and installed it on the bike. I then continued with the handlebars and removed rust, of course, as always. And didn't have a lot of problems there, really. It just was a little bit of just, I mean, just some some surface stuff and right around the, the actual grip with the, the gooseneck, it was a little bit of some stuff there. but. Uh, since, it was, the, since the paint wasn't that bad, I just decided to put on a clear coat and let it go with that. Next was continue with the bottom bracket, and uh, this was not in the best condition. As a matter of fact, it was in a situation that required... That I realized that one of the bearing cages had completely disintegrated, and the rust had just, 
just completely impregnated everything in there, including even the plastic insert, which is initially designed was initially designed to help prevent certain water and and you know things like that in intrusions in there. But it didn't it didn't help at all for the, in this case because it was just probably just like standing water in there probably at one point. Luckily, the other cage did not look bad at all. It just had the, a little bit of corrosion and things like that. The grease was definitely sticky and not helping at all to rotate the, the axle at all. But as always, I go ahead and toss it all into my mineral spirits and it just does an amazing job of breaking down all that stickiness and all the, the, the grease and grime that's stuck in there brings out the shine very quickly. Since one of my bearing cages had uh, completely disintegrated, I went ahead and searched for another one, which of course I had a, but a bag of them because this happens quite often. And just went ahead and grabbed that one and tossed it in there to replace the one that was, was bad. The other one looked actually quite well, so I didn't have to necessarily do anything more with it. Also because of the way that the bearing cage and bearings had been so rusted, it actually did score the inside of the cup, the bearing cup. And so I figured I'd just go ahead and find a replacement for that one as well. Cleans up pretty nice, right? Because I had replaced the uh, the cone, then or the cup, sorry, the, then I had to also replace the lock nut, or at least check to see that the original lock nut would work on the, on the new one. After confirming that the bearings looked pretty good, I went ahead and started to reassemble the bottom bracket on the bike. The square taper is maybe not quite as indestructible as the single piece crank from earlier eras or from cheaper bikes, but it does, and of course it is much, well, it's kind of lighter, more or less, but it's still rather, rather bulletproof, uh, rather indestructible. And like, again, as long as you don't let a lot of rust and things get into it, then you know water etc it usually will be able to maintain the the, the integrity you know the, the metal integrity and of course it'll be it's still easily serviceable just like the one piece crank is after the clear coat dried on the handlebars i went ahead and installed those as well pretty straightforward and nothing really fantastic other than just put it back on the bike center it correctly and make sure that the rotation on the handlebars is appropriate for the height of the bike and later I'll check the orientation of the gooseneck to make sure it's aligned correctly with the, the front wheel once I get the wheel on. Next was to continue with the crank and cleaning that up and preparing that for the bike of course and I had used some steel wool and my wire brush to kind of clean off some of the junk and give a little bit of a shine but the real key was that I noticed that a lot of the teeth were starting to wear and I didn't necessarily like that so I went ahead and used my Dremel tool with the stone attachment a small circular a cylindrical stone attachment and used that to basically clean out the valleys between the teeth. I really can't do too much. I can't make the teeth longer or make them more pronounced, but I can definitely make the valleys more deeper so that the, the groove where the, the chain links um, will fit are, are, will not slip in and cause any, any damage or anything like that. Obviously, we don't, want the, we don't want them to slip. So it was a really nice way of doing this. It's a little hack that I picked up for, that within the past few months that I like a lot because even though you do expose the steel, I mean, it should be covered with, with grease or some lubricant anyway, so I'm not too worried about uh, any of the rust or things like that because it's constantly being worn by the actual chain itself. Granted, you don't leave your bike out in the rain and leave it exposed to the elements, then that should not be a problem. Once I finished the crank teeth, then I went ahead and just did a little bit more cleaning up around the, the, the crank arms, just cleaning up with some steel wool and making sure they got off most of the rust and, and the dirt as best I possibly could with my different tools that I have, including my wire brush, steel wool, even some folded 6x6 
sandpaper to get between the, the, the different uh, cogs of the crank itself and the chain rings. And because this is all stamped steel, there's there's no way for me to take it apart and, and clean it properly. I just have to accept it as it is. Because this was a three-piece crank, I didn't have to take off any of the pedals. And it's a little bit easier to work with each of when I want to clean the pedals as well, that I don't have to remove them. Um, I didn't check to necessarily see if I could uh, remove them and, and maybe clean the threads on the, the pedals. Maybe I should have done that. I didn't do that at this time. I was able to force a little bit of grease down into the groove, the ball bearings, because I didn't really want to take them apart. They spun well, and I just wanted to make sure that they were lubricated. Putting on the crank was relatively straightforward with nothing overly complicated. The square taper, of course, is still just a simple design, but very, very effective, even to the point where, as I'm putting on the nuts, and you see me just stepping away for a sec to get some more stuff, a testament to the fact that that bottom bracket, that square taper bottom bracket, can literally move with such buttery smoothness as to defy, I would say, and I would, to my point, I would say even contest the ability for sealed bearings to do the same thing as this. It's just simply just amazing and still maintains that durability. Yes, it is heavy compared to a something like Holotech or, or Splined, whatever. There are so many other uh, type of, you know, the press, press bearings uh, for bottom brackets and stuff like that. There are so many other different designs out there, but you just simply cannot beat this pure smoothness that you get and the lack of friction as you can see with this with this crank. After I'd attached the nuts and the dust covers, I actually had to just spin it just to admire incredible ability for that to rotate with no effort whatsoever. Just amazing, really. Again, I, I can't even put it into words. Next, I moved on to the pedals because now I had it back on the on the bike. It's easier to handle them there. One did have a dust cover on the outside, so it was a little difficult for me to get in there and, and actually service them without destroying that dust cover. But the the one on the non-drive side was actually, or sorry, on the drive side was actually missing. So that one I did clean up a little bit, make sure it was greased, and and dug around to find something amongst all my stoppers that would be able to serve as some sort of a protector and was somewhat successful. I wouldn't say that I found the exact requirement that I wanted. I mean, obviously, I'd try to find something maybe the same color or something like that. And that wasn't necessarily what I found, but I tried with what I had. By straightening out some of the uh, little teeth or whatever you want to call those to, to hold it in place with my allen key I was hoping to spread it out enough so that it would actually grab onto the, the pedal itself and was marginally successful I really didn't get the the results that I wanted to but hey I'm again like I say just try to do whatever I can I finally just cut them off to see if it because they were bottoming out in the in the actual pedal so I figured it'd just be better if I went ahead and cut them off to see if it would hold I then continued with the rear derailleur and the first thing I did was to check that it was mechanically sound, meaning that it was able to shift properly from one gear to the next, you know, basically that the the different uh, pivot points were working as expected. Then I started in on my polishing with my Dremel tool, which of course is with that little wire brush is really nice to, to use for getting into the, all the little difficult parts and be able to to make it work as expected and, and make it nice and shiny that's really the intent is to make it look newer from there i removed the idler pulleys cleaned those up greased the the bearings in there as well i put those back on the the rear derailleur i should mention that i have these cheap chinese wire 
brushes because they were like a dime a dozen. They were really cheap. I, went, I said, well, I might as well get a bunch of these things because I use them so much. But unfortunately, as you can see, at sometimes in these videos, you will see the little wire bristles flying off as they as it slowly disintegrates over time. Can be dangerous to me. Uh, my eyes, more than anything, is those, those things can fly up and they do hit me in the face. So I, I have to be very careful to make sure I wear eye protection and uh, so I don't get any of those things in my eyes. And I have had them stuck in my clothes at times and things like that. So it, they are somewhat dangerous. I mean, I, I would, I'm not happy with the quality. As a matter of fact, there are some of them that are actually off balance and so they, they vibrate a lot in my hand as I'm using them and not not the best quality as I said you know, what do you expect you know when you buy you know 50 at a time I lost the video of me actually mounting the rear derailleur on the bike so unfortunately I cannot show that but I did start in on the front derailleur and basically the front derailleur just needed to be cleaned up there was really nothing mechanically incorrect with it uh, just want to make sure it looked better and was able to get most of the junk off. Unfortunately, there's so many little corners and nooks and crannies and, and places to, to, that the junk gets in there. It does take quite a while, so I had to use my Dremel with a very a, a fine point to remove a lot of the, 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 the parts that were really hidden. I do use Q-tips every once in a while as well because they the swabs are able to to get in certain areas, but they just they're just not precise enough. So and wire brushes can only get so far as well, so it's not 100%. But again, you do what you can do and uh, and basically clean them up and just make sure it's available to be mounted back onto the bike. And of course, I put it back on. The important thing is, is when you when you mount a front derailleur on a bike, just make sure that the it, as you, as it swings, as the arm swings out, as it's being engaged, that it doesn't hit the crank, but that it's close enough that it's not too far up. Because if it's too far up, then of course it won't really do the it won't derail the the chain correctly. So there's 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 a sweet spot right there that between that um, being too close or too far that you want to make sure that the that front derailleur is is set correctly. With both derailleurs mounted, now I went ahead and opened the new chain package because the old chain just simply was not going to work. It was just way too rusted. And as always, I typically will take that chain and clean it with my mineral spirits to get take off the the factory grease because it typically is not that good. And I like waxing or or using the Teflon for my, my chains because I just like it. It's a dry lube and especially in Texas where it's way, way, way too hot and way, way, way too dry <laughs> to collect a bunch of dirt and dust and things like that. So I put the chain on the the largest two gears to make sure that I'm able to bring it the bring it as close as possible to the, the right length because you have to set it so that it will the, the derailleur will will accept the the longest length and the shortest length and the shortest length is the one that is determined by the two height the, the, the two greatest gears obviously for the, the largest cog on the on the crank and the largest largest cog on the sprocket so once they do that i break the chain take off the excess that's not going to be used put on it back with the uh, you know use my chain breaker to to reattach the the, the pin and then it's pretty much done. There's not too much more to do. And I just check it to make sure that the larger sprocket is the best for the large to large, large, which is not very common. But then I bring it back down to the lowest. I also went ahead and just, I saw there's a little bit of junk on the sprocket. So I went ahead and cleaned it with some folded sandpaper. That's kind of the good way of me to take off some of this rust if it's starting to accumulate. Um, I guess I hadn't really cleaned the, the sprocket in some time, so it was starting to get there again. So again, hitting it with this, the sandpaper and my mineral spirits is the way to to keep it, to try to clean it up a little bit. It's easier to do also when you have a chain under because then you can, you can crank it with the chain and not have to try to do it by hand. Next was to clean up the brake levers and get them set up on the handlebars. If you notice, my 
wheels and tires magically appeared on the bike. I don't know what happened to my video of that. It very well may have been just me grabbing some tires, throwing them on the, the wheels and putting them on the bike. So there was not too much there, but again, it's not because I didn't really do too much work on the actual hubs of the wheels, then I didn't feel like it was necessary to go through a lot of that. After cleaning up the brake levers, I went ahead and installed those on the handlebars. Usually I leave them, them loose because I want to be able to put the shifters on and the grips and then adjust backwards from there. Next I installed the grip shifters, which were some, some new um, grip shifters. Although the previous ones that were on the bike were some SRAM grip shifts and I thought they were pretty nice and I did have to unfortunately go to a lesser quality grip shifters. They were newer and I think that I would opt to have the newness over the quality to hopefully have some more reliability for shifting and things like that. It was, um, it was a hard decision to make. From there, I stuck those on the, the handlebars as well and uh, basically was able to cut some regular length handle grips to the size that I wanted to accommodate those grip shifters and that way they would allow, they wouldn't stick out too far or cause the brake levers to go too far in on the, on the handlebars. So I, that's the reason why I had to cut them to, to size. I should mention one of the good hacks that I have for putting handlebar grips on the handlebars is to put a little bit of WD-40 or some sort of a uh, penetrating wheel inside there, just a couple drops, and just coat the inside of the grip itself and quickly get it onto the handlebar. And what it does is actually, well, it kind of cleans out some of that, uh, the junk that's inside there but at the same time gives you the ability to get it on, the, on quickly with a little bit of, strangely enough, a little bit of lubrication, but that will evaporate quickly as well and allow the handlebar grip to stick to the handlebar itself. Once the grips are on, then it's much easier to bring the shifters back to the limit or the ends of the grips and then adjust the brake levers as well so that they all now fit kind of nice and neatly from the out, outside in. I then went ahead and installed the front brake on the bike, chose an appropriate length for the brake cable housing, installed a new brake cable and fed that through the housing and through the housing retainer, linked that up with the retainer on the well, actually, it's more of a, so more like a bracket, or I should say, it's a, it's, a, it's a separate piece that connects on to create the bridge across the two arms of the center pole brake. And because of the way that it's set up, there is an adjustment that needs to be made to make sure that it does pull correctly from one end to the other and does basically what it says, center pull. You don't want it to pull to one side or the other because then you start to wear the left or the right hand arm or, or a brake pad unduly. As I was doing that, I realized that the front wheel was just slightly out of alignment. So I went ahead and drew the front wheel. After adjusting the front wheel a little bit, I realized again that my axle was a little bit on the loose side. So I tightened up the, the bearing cones so that there was no play in the front wheel. After my initial truing, then I go ahead and stress the wheel a little bit because it requires that to settle the spokes because the spokes because of the twisting, the torsion caused by my adjustments will cause it to actually settle over time and I would prefer to do that first, checking, checking to make sure that it is trued correctly. From there I replaced the wheel on the bike and adjusted the cables and just confirmed that the brake was not hitting the rim while pulling on the brake. So then I started in on the rear brake and even though the bike had a V brake on there, which of course I didn't necessarily like, I thought it would be much better to have a center pull brake just like the front and 
having a stored Shimano center pole brake in my stock, I went ahead and installed that along with centering that this time I did have to center the brake pads so that it would line up correctly with the rim. Because of the way these are made, they are quite easy to maintain once you tighten them because it holds their position rather well. From there, I connected the rear brake cable along with the housing that I had set up as well. And as always, I put a little bit of grease on the cable just to prep it so that it doesn't get undue rust or anything inside the housing and cause it to foul. Uh, it's always nice to put something like that as well as putting on a little rubber ferrule or protector to prevent the cable from hitting the frame too much. I will admit that the center pull brakes are actually rather ingenious in their simple design and yet very effective capabilities. Once I had them installed, I then adjusted the, the set screw for the tension just to make sure that it was pulling correctly. And once I had that done, the, the brakes were, I mean, simple. Simple to maintain and simple to set up and effective again, as I say, on, on stopping the bike, which is what brakes are really intended for, right? As the final touch, I added the brake and cap just to keep it from fraying. I then started in on the derailleur cables and housings, went ahead and cut some to length with my Dremel cutoff tool. Very ingenious using a Dremel is just an amazing tool for so many different things and uh, it does an excellent job cutting through the, that the hardened steel that they use for the, the cables. Not something you just clip through or, or cut. It, I mean, not not at least not with the like pliers or something like that. It's just it's, they're too hard. But it actually does a really good job. The only problem is, is that when you do use that, it does actually burn the plastic, the, in, the plastic insert. And you do have to kind of clean that out. Otherwise, the cable would not pass through it. As always, a little bit of grease helps the whole thing stay nice and lubricated. So I always do that. Usually start at the beginning, working my way back from the shifter to the derailleur, whether it be the front or rear derailleur. And as always, putting on a rubber ferrule that I always put on there to protect the frame. Sometimes I have to remind myself to do that because I'll, I'll get it on there and not forget and I have to take it back off to put it back to put that thing on there because it does it does protect the, the wire from causing damage to the frame. And this is where I began realizing that I had a mistake I had some mistakes. And one of the mistakes was that the cable was actually too long. Because this was a large frame bike, then it was just about maybe an inch too short to reach the rear derailleur. So I had to take out the old derailleur cable and get a new one. So I went ahead and dug one out of my box of cables and went ahead and fed that through there to, to check that. I also cleaned up a little bit of the burrs that were on the, the cable stop because it, it has the, it's just, it's just cheap manu Chinese manufacturing, that's all it is. But the, you kind of clean it up so it doesn't, it doesn't leave some extra stuff around and it's kind of nice. So threading the cable back through the, the shifter and the housing and putting on my ferrule, I looked at it and lo and behold, <laughs> this was too short too. I mean, I, I look, I was like, oh man, it's off by just the, the, the short. I was like, can I stretch it out just a little bit? Nope, couldn't do it. So back to my box to get a longer cable. So this time I pulled a cable from a set that I knew that had the shorter and longer cables in it so it was easier for me to recognize which was which and I made sure absolutely sure that this was long enough before I stuck it through so I did a, a quick check for the length so once I was satisfied with the length I went ahead and pulled out the shorter one and actually pulled them and checked them just side by side and said oh yeah so I had an extra two to three inches which is what I was looking for. From there, I connected the cable to the screw on the rear derailleur. I then continued with the front derailleur and cut my cable housing to size for that as well. And as always, added the lubricant. 
checking to make sure it was long enough as well. Didn't want to have a short one just like the rear derailleur. And found that, of course, <laughs> it was too short as well. So apparently that was also incorrect. So checking the length, I can do the same thing as always and add more lubricant and all that good stuff. And as well, you see, I forgot to put my ferrule on the front derailleur cable as I typically forget. Then I took it through the final check to make sure that the rear derailleur was working correctly as well as the front derailleur. Checked my limits, make sure my stops were good. I was looking pretty close to being done with this. 